big time meaningful basketball because we did. But we are about to get a really good kickoff for the Lakers, man. This is going to be fun. It's going to be fun. And uh, Anthony Davis, LeBron James, they're locked up long term. So that makes Laker fans real happy. And the Lakers just added another name to that list. Kyle Kuzma agreed to a three-year, $40 million contract extension with the Lake Show. The deal keeps him with the Lakers through the 2022-23 season with a player option in the 2023-24 season. Lakers GM Rob Polinka in a press release had this to say about Kuzma's deal. It is especially gratifying for our Laker franchise to draft, develop, and now sign one of our own to a contract extension. Kyle has shown tremendous growth over the last three years and played a crucial ro role on last season's championship team. Kyle has been a terrific member of the Lakers community, and we're all very excited about his continued future with us. After practice on Monday, Kuzma broke down why he decided to do this move before the season started. You know, I was kind of really up in the air. You know, I wasn't too bent to really try to get something done um, unless it was just the right situation. Um, you know, it's never always about the money. You know, I'm, I'm still so young um, in the game of basketball to where Um, I have opportunities for that, but it's all about um, just the situation, and um, we got we got a great situation. I personally couldn't be more excited that uh, you know we got Kuz uh, into a, contra a contract extension. Uh, he'll be with us for years to come, and um, you know I just love what the young man represents. You know he, he's one of our hardest workers. Uh, he's a team first guy. He's he's sacrificed you know in, in many ways. Uh, to help us win a championship, he's willing to do the same again, and um, you know he's the kind of player that that we want here with LA Lakers. You know, on the floor, you know, as someone that's versatile offensively, uh, is a two-way player that impacts the game on both ends, and um, you know has that that desire to win at a high level. So he's a big part of last year's championship, and uh, you know he's a huge part of uh, of what we hope to do this year as well. Yeah, I mean, it's good for him. Uh, you don't have that, you know, contract anxiety for the whole year. You know, now that it's out the way, he can go out there and play. Um, and which, which he was doing anyway. You know, he was having a great, you know, preseason. And he even played great for us uh, in a bubble um, and all last year. So, um, you know, he, he's, he's locked in. He's making – he made a great jump on both ends of the floor. Uh, he wants to – take those matchups. He wanted to guard Book in the preseason. He wanted to guard Kawhi in the preseason So uh, and Paul. So he, he wants those matchups. He, he's playing extremely well for us on the offensive end, uh, making the big shots, uh, you know, shooting the ball extremely well, making the right play, the right passes. Um, so it's, it's good for him. You know, we're excited to have him here. Uh, you know, I know he's excited to be here. Um, and he's a champion, you know, you deserve it. And I'm glad um, that the Lakers were able to, you know, work something out with him to, to be able to allow him to just go out there and play and not worry about contracts for the rest of the season. Being in a situation to have my family be set for life and, um, you know, to be from Flint, Michigan, where, you know, it's a really impoverished place. And um, now I can just do a little bit of a uh, little more good back home as well. So, um, you know, it feels good. LeBron James giving a shout out to young Kuz on Instagram saying, yes, sir, Kuz, congrats, bro. Wine Chronicles on you next time. And then Kuz responds with a bottle of wine saying, is this a good start, Brez, our <laughs> wine connoisseur? Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Listen, a lot of expectations um, on Kuzma from Laker fans. He's playing alongside two of the best guys in the league, two Hall of Famers. I'm happy for Kuz, happy for the Lakers. Three years, 40 is a great deal Brez for both sides, Absolutely. especially today you're seeing big numbers around the league for guys that aren't in Kuz's league. Yeah, there's some role players out there that have signed deals for like 15, 16 million a year going forward. Very equitable for both sides. Love this deal. I mean, if you look at uh, when this extension starts next year, Kuz will be making about 12 and a half million. The average salary in the NBA is going to be about 10, 10 and a half million. So, yeah, it's a good deal for Kuz. He's, he's got some money. He can opt out for that third year if, he's, uh, if he wants to try the market again. And I think what it means, you're going to see the Lakers like this for the next few years. What you see is what you get. Uh, LeBron tied up long term, AD as well. Kuz, no doubt about it. And uh, not a lot of free agent money next year, probably a mini mid level. But hey, it, it's, it's a pretty good nucleus with those three right now. AK? 
I love the way it gives flexibility for both sides of this. With the Lakers, they know they've got a guy like Kuzma locked in for the next couple of years. They're looking for him to really develop consistently the type of two-way prowess that they've seen in spurts, but never on a regular basis. But now I think Kuzma cannot be concerned about whether or not his role is going to lead to better, you know, a better contract, that sort of thing. It gives them more flexibility, to be perfectly frank, if they ever wanted to try to move him because the team that would be taking him on knows exactly what he'll be getting paid for the next few years. And it also gives Kuzma flexibility if he actually out, outplays this deal. He's not going to be on it very long because he's got that third-year player option. Mm-hmm. I just think this works really well for both sides. And I also think it's great, too, as Rob Palinka noted, that they're rewarding one of their own. And I don't think it's an accident that they made sure people knew that. It reminds me a little bit. It's not an apples-to-apples comparison but with what the Lakers did towards the end of Kobe's career with that extension, you know, just projecting the idea of players that mean something to us, we're going to make sure we take care of them. And I, and I think that's a big part of it with Kuz. Prez, you got into the numbers a little bit. What does this mean moving forward? Yeah, it, it means the Lakers are going to be over the, the cap. Uh, they're going to be able to sign someone next year for about, you know, $5 million uh, for, for a year. They're not going to have a ton of money. But, but you have good players. You have uh, LeBron here for, for three more years. You have AD here for five more years. Uh, Schroeder will be a free agent in a year. The Lakers like what they see. They can go over the salary cap to re-sign their own. You know, it's the start of a very strong team, with, with, which is under contractual obligations for several years. Uh, and I like what they, what they did here with Cruz. Like AK said, they, they drafted this guy, and now they're going to extend him. It's kind of like what they did with, um, and, and there you see the numbers right there, 12.3, just a little bit above what the average salary will be for, for an NBA player that year. Going back to what I was saying, the Lakers gave Jordan Clarkson four years and $50 million a few years ago. This is kind of similar to that. So, you know, it's one year less, but they like to reward these guys that they draft in the second round or late in the first round. They develop them. You know, big uh, kudos to Jesse Buss and the Lakers scouting department for grabbing coups that late in the first round. And also kudos to Rob Palenka and the rest of the Laker organization for stepping up and doing this, like I said, very equitable deal for both sides. Yeah, happy for Coos, his bomb, yeah. of course, who's, yeah. uh, you know, yes. a huge fan. And we always you know, follow her and put her on the show or tweets and stuff. So very happy for them from Flint, Michigan. So Good congratulations, Coos. Frank Vogel said this week that he's uh, keeping his starting lineup close to the vest. Uh, with Dennis Schroeder resting, here is what they went with in the final preseason game. LeBron, KCP, Kuz, Anthony Davis, and Mark Gasol. I think everyone just assumes Schroeder's going to slide into that spot. Kuz will come off the bench with Harrell, Caruso, and you know, as deep as the Lakers are, we talk a lot about it. Okay, I want to get a lineup from you guys. AK, I'm going to start with you. This is not your starting lineup. This is not your closing lineup. This is your favorite lineup that you want to see, your favorite combination. Give it to me. Well, I'm really intrigued right now to see what I think will be the second unit. Mm -hmm. And I got to disagree with you, Geeter. I think Dennis Schroeder ultimately is going to end up coming off the bench more because I think that's best for the Lakers. AC, Markeith Morris, Montrez Harrell, and then I'm going to shoot the moon here with THT. But I think you also could (laughs) potentially, you could potentially see Wes Matthews there, potentially Kuzma. But what matters here is that this second unit gels and plays really well together. Because when you take into account the context of this season, how long it stretched out and then how short the off season was, the mileage on LeBron and the way last season, the Lakers often cratered whenever LeBron was off the floor, not even for that long. And also, you know, Anthony Davis carried a pretty big burden last season as well. It is crucial that you can put a second unit out there that forget you know, just matching buckets can actually build leads. I think it's going to make it the easiest way to allow LeBron and AD to recharge from last season. So this second unit is really critical. I really want to see what it looks like. Quickly, AK, I don't disagree that Schroeder might be better for this team coming off the bench, but do you agree that he's probably going to start? How long into the season do you think until he goes off the bench? I, I, I hope that if the Lakers ultimately think that that's what's best for the team, that he comes off the bench, they just do it right away. Yeah. You know, because, I mean, you might as well just hit the ground running with this. Schroeder's going to play big minutes, and I think what matters most is if he actually closes games. But I just think it makes more sense for him to be coming off the bench. Either way, I think he's going to be playing a ton of minutes with that second unit. 
All right, Brez, we know how deep this team is. Is there a combination, maybe a favorite lineup of yours early on that you want to see? Yeah, it's kind of like the one we showed earlier, the starting lineup from that uh, last preseason game. I'd probably sub uh, Schroeder in there for KCP. I like guys that can score and shoot. I think you get this with pretty much all these guys, guys who are not afraid to put the, the ball in the air. Uh, Marcus Saul, kind of the, the straw that stirs the drink as far as a post player who likes setting up his guys. Uh, all these guys have range. All these guys can put 20 up in a game. Maybe not Marcus Saul anymore. He only averaged about eight points last season in, in Toronto. But I, I just like the fact that he can uh, really extend the offense out beyond the uh, three point line and also get a few nice assists like we saw a lot during the preseason. I think it'll change from time to time. Do you guys have an odd man out? Like that 11th guy, Markeith Morris, THT. I mean, remember Markeith last year, then all of a sudden he was a, a big time uh, mm -hmm. uh, player in the playoffs. It might be THT. I mean, I mean, and, and good yes. for him for showing us what he, did, what he could do in the preseason. Not a lot of run for him in that fourth and final preseason game. He's still a young guy. He's still yeah. one of the youngest guys 20. in the entire league, right? Yeah. And, you know, I think Frank Vogel might say, okay, we know what we have with him. Let's let the vets kind of kind of marinate on this season, try to get it back to back. And as the season goes, he yeah, finds a way to get him in. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if there were such thing as seeding games again this year, I think we'd see a lot of THT in those. Or if the Lakers kind of run away with the West, and, and then you throw THT in, in some of the meaningless games. Press sounded really smart, uh, smart AK, so we're going to leave it at that. <laughs> and, and, and we're going to go to Brad. I don't want you to ruin it First for time him, ever. All right. <laughs> Still to come. Uh, it might not have counted. Put the back with the T-Wolves and Trailblazers on the 27-28. You can see those right here. And then the Lakers close out 2020 on the road against San Antonio. For more on what should be an eventful opening night, let's send it over to Derek Fisher and Allie Clark. Thanks so much, Geeter. Uh, Fish, tomorrow things get real for the 2020-21 season. Uh, let's start first with, obviously we know everything is going to be different. Um, opening night, usually for the defending NBA champs, it's spring night. You, you watch that banner go up. There will, not, there will not be a banner going up tomorrow night. There will be ring ceremony, though. What do you remember from your time, those nights, just how special they are and what it'll be like for those guys tomorrow night? Yes, I mean, I think as you stated, although it will be different, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's still a, a once-in-a-lifetime night. Uh, yeah. You don't get to experience a lot in your career uh, and in your lifetime. And I think probably the most difficult part for the players will be that their families, their children, their loved ones, their spouses, significant others can't be there to feel the emotion that they are still probably going to feel um, as they experience the ring ceremony. Uh, so it's different. I think the celebration, the fans, the banner, it'll come in due time, but it'll still be a special night for the players. So obviously there's still going to be a game played. What is the key to not having an emotional letdown, a, a mental letdown, just in terms of that excitement and then having to refocus, lock in to start the season the way you want to. Yeah, I think what helps, honestly, is that they're playing the Clippers. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's built uh, in. <laughs> and yeah, and, I, and I, I do believe that helps um, personalize the game in a different way. Uh, most of the time on ring night, uh, you're not necessarily playing your crosstown rival that has also championship expectations and that this game means a little bit more than just this opening night thing that you can throw away. Uh, people are going to put a lot of stock into this game, whether it means anything or not. So I think they kind of have a built-in reason why um, they're probably going to still try to come out and shake off the, the ring ceremony and, and try to win the game. Do you think they will still be damp? It's one of my favorite things that you talked about in the preseason, damp from having just won the title not too long ago. I think a little bit. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, That'll you, still be there. Yeah, the, the championship residue never really leaves, <laughs> um, and and I think they'll still have some, uh, even in that last preseason game. The way they started the game, that's championship residue. I, it's just like, look, man, let's get this over with. I'm ready to get to what counts. Um, so they'll have some of that, but I think the new players they've added, those guys that don't have that residue, it's going to be good to have those guys to remind them of what this is all about and is trying to get back to the top of that mountain again. That's where I want to transition to. We'll talk about the stars in a second. But the new guys that they did add, Montrose Harrell, Marcus Saul, Dennis Schroeder, Wes Matthews specifically, what you saw of them a little bit there in the preseason, what excites you about them adding to the roster that's already here? I think the main thing that excites me about all of the new guys is uh, a level of grit and physical toughness that they all play the game with. Um, uh, not necessarily specialists or somebody that just shoots threes or someone that, you know, just is a facilitator. All four of these guys get after it 
They're physical. They play tough basketball. Um, I think Schroeder has an opportunity to be a guy that can get downhill and get to the rim uh, and finish plays for himself, make others better. Wes Matthews is going to be, I think, an underrated addition to this group. We won't always hear his name a lot, but when we look back at the games, we'll see him doing a lot of little things that make a difference. Mark Gasol is a champion, a winner, a great passer, um, really smart, high basketball IQ. And then Montrez Harrell is going to bring, I think, just that passion, the dog, the fight, the competitive spirit. Uh, so I, I love those type of additions uh, as opposed to just adding guys that are there maybe just to ride on the coattails of the guys already here. Like these guys are here to make noise and, and make a difference. One thing I always appreciate about you is that you always have your coaching cap on. And, and we talked about it a little bit during the preseason, the options, the good problems that Frank Vogel has on his hands. Can you shed a little perspective on that? Yeah, um, as a coach, it's if like you, you're basically a handyman. Mm -hmm. or a handy woman and you have a toolbox and when you open that box and there's only two or three tools in there it's not well, a lot of, not a lot of things you can fix <laughs> yeah. uh, but when you can open that box and, and there's a tool for every situation you're going to find yourself in that that's a confident handy person right there mm -hmm. and uh, and I think Frank Vogel is in that position this year where Whatever the game dictates, big lineup, small lineup, offensive lineup, defensive lineup, speed lineup, size lineup, he has everything. And what makes his job uh, tough but good and, and easier is having LeBron James and Anthony Davis, not their talent, but who they are as men, their character, their integrity. They seem to find a way to, to encourage and invite their teammates to, like, it's fun to be on their team. The chemistry, the way they all buy in with each other, uh, to have all those tools in there clanking and not mixing well with each other, that's not good. But these guys enjoy being in the toolbox together, putting work in together. And uh, I think Frank Vogel is going to enjoy having these options this year. One final point when it comes to the superstars. We saw what they could do in just one season together. How much better can they be in their second? That's going to be the fun part. I think that, that's the thing that uh, you know I'll be most intrigued by is how special do they want to make this season. Right? Do, it's easy uh, to just kind of go through the motions, win enough games to still be relevant or still be one of the best teams, and then just try to hurry up and be the best at a certain time. Um, but that's not what Kobe Bryant was about. Right? That's not what the great ones are about. I don't think LeBron has been about that in his career necessarily. Like it's, you're not guaranteed to get to next month or three months or four months from now. Only thing you can control is opening night. And if they can find a way, that's what I loved about Frank Vogel's approach last year. All he was about was today, this game, tonight, this quarter, this possession. And if they can really like remain in love with the process, remain in love with dating and courting, right? <laughs> Enjoy that part of the process and don't get bored. That's when you can look up in the 72 game season and they can be, you know, 60 and 12. And that you don't have to get complacent. Uh, you're, 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 you can be special and that's, that's what I want to see. I want to see him really shoot to, and strive to be special this year. Special like him. Five-time champ. D. Fish. Thanks as always. Thank you, Ali. Pete, back over to you. Distance. Help stop the spread. Help stop the spread. Please wear a mask. Please wear a mask. Please wear a mask. Help stop the spread. Please wear a mask. The NBA is in a different scenario this season. The league had zero positive COVID-19 tests in the bubble through the playoffs, which was a huge achievement. This time around, there's no bubble, but there's a vaccine on its way. In an interview with ESPN, NBA Commissioner Adam Silver made it clear the players won't be getting preferential treatment. No, there's, there's no way we would ever jump the line in, in, in any form whatsoever. Um, and for the most part, because our players are young and healthy without some sort of comorbidity, they will not be a high pro priority for vaccinations. I mean, there are some other members of the NBA community um, working you know, on court who are older and will have a higher priority to get the vaccine. But as I said, I mean, we, we will, I think very likely be part of some public service campaigns. We've already talked to the CDC and other, mm -hmm. other governmental agencies about that, encouraging people to get vaccinated when it is appropriate. Now that we're going to be in, in essence, 30 different markets, 
or you know, and and, and completely outside of a, a bubble, there's no doubt we're going to have issues. We know that even people who are following all of our rules exactly as intended, that when you're living at home, you have children in school, you have family members who are out and about. Um, no one is immune from this virus. I mean, we saw it when our players first came into training camp just a few weeks ago. You know, we had essentially 50 positive cases just to begin training camp. And this is not necessarily because mm. anyone engaged in reckless activity. It's because they're living li their lives like most other Americans are. NBA is doing its best for the safety of the players and the game staff. And listen, we're in uncharted waters once again here. And after watching the NBA in the bubble, the NFL going through it, college sports, football, basketball. Um, we're seeing the testing getting better. Uh, Brez, are, are you confident for the NBA this time around? Quietly confident. Yeah. I mean, we kind of got spoiled by the bubble. Yeah. You know, we, we weren't the guys there for three months, like the team and that the staffers and the coaches. Right? That's that, a special circumstance. That, that, yeah. that won't happen again. You know, maybe the NBA does do one for the playoffs several months from now. Can't, can't predict that. But as of now, there's no plans or anything like that. So what you have now is a sort of return to normalcy. Teams are going to travel. Um, they're going to be playing games in arenas. There will not be fans at Staples Center for the foreseeable future. That, that's obvious. But, you know, once you have travel in the equation, you're no longer in a non-permeable bubble. You open yourself up to possibilities of, of people getting sick yeah. and games being postponed or, or even suspended or canceled. We, we just don't know what's going to happen. Are you confident, Andy? And, and I'm sure you're confident how, how the NBA will handle it because you know they have every scenario ready to go. Yeah, that's one of the reasons that I am confident that the season will be able to complete. I think there's obviously going to be positive tests. I mean, these guys are a part of worldwide society and there are positive tests all over this global pandemic. But I trust the NBA to take these protocols very seriously. I trust them to have thought out a lot of different scenarios. You, you heard Adam Silver talk about how they're looking to have players out in front when it comes to encouraging vaccination. We've already seen, you know, just leading into this segment right now, the Lakers, different players reminding you, wear your mask. If you want to return back to normalcy, do the things that are being asked of you. And I think that really reflects the league as a whole. All right, guys, moving forward, Clippers and Lakers both made some big moves this offseason. The Clippers signed Paul George to a four-year extension. The champs brought back the Brow on a five-year deal. Here's what they did last season. AD leading all categories other than three-point percentage. Recently, PG-13 said that AD had a chance to join him in Indiana a few years back. Here's the Brow's response. The Paul, Paul thing in Indiana, uh, it was a conversation for sure. Um, kind of just faded away. You know, I'm not sure what happened on their end. He said that management didn't want to do it, whatever. Um, but it was, it was a conversation. Um, and then, you know, what Bron saying, what he's saying, obviously want to, um, you know, team up. And, and then, you know, the year that we do, we win a championship. So um, I think uh, Bron kind of spoke it into existence and, you know, it happened. And uh, I'm glad it happened. Um, you know, for, for, for me, uh, you know, selfish reasons, you know, I want to be a champion and able to, to do that my first year um, teaming up with him. Uh, but, I mean, who would have known? Who, who knows what would have happened with, with Paul um, in Indiana? You know, he's another great player, you know, especially when he was in Indiana. He was, you know, he was definitely tough to guard. He's still tough to guard today. Uh, but I think that was so long ago that, you know, we played each other many times, you know, since then. Um, you know, but you always think about like what could have happened, you know, would my career be a lot different than it is now. Listen, we shouldn't be surprised. And, and when it comes to tampering and everyone looking into what GMs are doing and organizations, the players are the ones that are always talking about <laughs> yeah. So we're not surprised by this, right? No, not at all. I mean, it's a big no-no. They're putting no. super teams together. Oh, for sure. You know, it's a big no-no for teams to contact players or agents ahead of time. We just saw the Milwaukee Bucks. They lost a second round draft pick for, for kind of tampering with uh, Bogdan Bogdanovich. Players can do whatever they want. And I don't think they're supposed to. I think the NBA could enforce this rule. G good luck. Good luck. You know, you're going to tell LeBron, hey, uh, yeah, you can't talk to this guy. If you see him in uh, Vegas during summer league, uh, it's against the rules, LeBron. You know, keep, keep to yourself. Nah, players are going to talk all the time. It's not going to be enforced. But when teams do it, that's when you get into a little murky area and you can be in a, a trouble spot there. Yeah, I mean, you remember KD and Kyrie just, you know, signing right away in Brooklyn. Yeah. Obviously, that's right. planned, you know. Yeah. Paul George signs 
contract in Oklahoma. The next year, he's going to play with Kawhi yeah. in L.A. It's just the way this way it is, guys. Yeah, I mean, the players have the ability to talk with each other. They have the ability to, you know, evaluate their own situations, evaluate the, what could be similar situations for players of their caliber. And and if you look at Paul George and Anthony Davis in that scenario, you're talking about two smaller market teams yeah. that, for a variety of reasons, were just having difficulty getting over the hump, but also, too, difficulty bringing in players of their caliber because, by and large, Players of that caliber want to play in bigger markets. It's not always the case. We just yeah. saw Giannis commit to Milwaukee. but And from everything we heard, all things being equal, Anthony Davis would have been willing to commit to New Orleans if he really thought that there was a possibility to be able to win a championship. But once it became clear that wasn't the case, usually these guys end up gravitating towards larger markets. And it's been that way for a long time, and I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. Uh, by the way, it would have made that Indiana team pretty good. Yeah, you got that right. Oh, yeah. Oof. But right? yeah. you're in Indiana and you wake up every day in the winter and it's, you know, minus six degrees. It's tough. It's tough. Hey, Let's throw a little shade at the I would, Hoosiers. I went to school Wisconsin, so I'm familiar with, with Midwest weather. <laughs> Believe me, you're, you'd be happier what? out here weather-wise. <laughs> is this just Big Ten stuff coming out, bro? Yeah, it kind of is. is. Like, this is some yeah. rivals. Is that, is that really what this shot was? Yeah. Get guilty as charged. All right. Still to come, we'll hear from Lakers and the Lakers. Not only won number 17, but she became the first female owner in NBA history to win a championship as the controlling owner. On Monday, she joined the Petros and Money Show and discussed her feelings heading into Tuesday's ring night. You know, I think when I put the ring on my finger tomorrow, I think that's when it'll really hit home for me. But, um, you know, what was what I thought, you know, what my dad wanted to do was to try to to surpass the Boston Celtics in terms of titles. To win number 17 and, and to, you know, to do that was, you know, I wish my dad was here to see it, but I know he would be, he'd be thrilled, he'd be proud. And so that's what that means to me. And, you know, the, the players... You know, you it, people in my position, our job is to give them all the resources, the platform, the tools, everything that they need to to win. And then it's up to them. And really, this championship is really a tribute to them and their heart and their their work. And, um, you know, so I'm happy to share it with them, you know, but I'm really Really excited that we got number 17, and hopefully we can, you know, get to 18 at some point, and uh, you know, continue what, you know, my the the the, the path that my father started this uh, fran legacy franchise on. You can hear it every time she talks about her team. Um, this has been her team her entire life, um, and in her tenure it hasn't always been easy the passing of her father kobe some rough times in lakerland brez but now adding that to your resume first ever title controlling owner female pretty special and it's number 17 tying boston she deserves it that's huge i can't tell you how many times i interviewed dr bus over the years and the boston celtics were never far from his mind mm -hmm. passing them one day and the lakers have yet to do that but they caught them that's a good start that was so important to, to Jeannie's dad and for her to, to get this team several years ago, you know, and then there were some bad years for this team, some playoff misses, uh, the retirement, you know, the final years, and then the retirement of Kobe Bryant. Lean years for the team. Yeah. You know, but great, bold moves, you know, uh, plucking you know, Rob Palenka out of the agent ranks and making him your GM. And now he's the, the VP of, of basketball ops in addition to being the GM. Strong move by, by Jeannie. LeBron. And LeBron, of course, you know, she's signing off on all these moves. Rob Polinka keeps her very much in the loop. Yeah. And Jeannie definitely has veto power. She, but but she, like her dad, she, she kind of says, you guys do it. I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'll write the checks. You front office, you figure it out. She's very good at empowering people and letting yeah. other people make the moves just like her father did. It's a winning combination. Yeah, well said. AK? I mean, first of all, uh, Gator, that glass ceiling that you referenced before that Jeannie shattered, I think yeah. it's really significant and Me it really too. matters, you know, it, in terms of the message that it sends to women of all different ages, all different aspirations, what they want to be doing professionally. You know, sports has been professional sports, traditionally a man's world in a way that hasn't always been particularly positive, sometimes even toxic. So Jeannie Bush 
accomplishing this in and of itself is very significant. It's also important to remember that, you know, a few years ago when Rob Palenka and then Magic Johnson were brought in, they were both inexperienced. Luke Walton, the coach at the time, was inexperienced. But so was Jeannie Buss as the ultimate shot caller of this organization. You know, she was unproven in, the, in, in that sense. She had been mentored by the greatest owner in the professional, in professional sports history, in Dr. Buss, but she still hadn't proved herself yet. We can all agree now she absolutely has. And again, it's just a remarkable achievement. Very happy for her. Ring's going to feel good. All right, start of the Lakers repeat aspirations begins Tuesday to get you ready for the start of the season. Let's look back at the top plays from the preseason. Count it or doubt it. I'm going to throw something on the board. You agree with it, you count it. You don't, you doubt it, and you give your argument. Brez, I'm going to let AK go first on the first one. He's the visitor. I like it. Visitor. What? Montrez Harrell playing against his former team looking for a revenge game. Montrez Harrell will score 18 points or more versus the Clippers. Andy Kamenetsky. Counter down it. Count it. I think he is going to be really geeked to play in this game. I also think the Lakers are going to be looking for opportunities to feed him, get this thing off to a really good start. But we, we know he is not happy about the way things ended with the Clippers. And we know this because he's basically said so. And I imagine he's been looking forward to this game. I think he's going to be really anxious to put it to his old team. I think he'll have opportunities. I'm counting this one. Not sure he was happy about Luke Kennard getting 64 million. Uh, Brez, Montrez Harrell will score 18 points or more versus the Clippers. Oh, yeah, count this for sure. I mean, this is right, right around what he averaged last year for the Clippers. Of course he's going to exceed that in his first game with the Lakers. And by the way, uh, he, he had a pretty good game against them in the preseason, too. So he is all ready to go. He knows the weaknesses. He knows uh, Serge Bach couldn't even catch like a half-court pass. That's why he grabbed it and dunked it. We just saw it in the last segment. So, yeah, count, count like uh, I'm going to go with 22 for Trez in that first game out. Brez, I'm going with you first on the second one. Uh, Dennis Schroeder kind of said, yeah, I'm starting. <laughs> so we don't know yet for sure who is. It's not confirmed. Is Dennis Schroeder starting on opening night? I'm going to count this mm -hmm. only because, you know, Frank Vogel reads, uh, he reads all the articles or, or he hears about it from reporters' questions. He knows that, that uh, Schroeder wants to start. And so he might say, all right, you're the new guy. You're in a contract here. We kind of want to keep you happy. Oh, and you're good, too. Let's see how you look with that first unit. Yeah, Dennis Schroeder breaking news that day saying, yeah, right. it's basically they promised me. <laughs> what, do, what, what do you think, AK? Count or doubt it? I'm going to count it. But I don't think it's going to stay that way the whole year because ultimately I think it's best for this team if Schroeder plays off the bench. I actually think it plays most to Schroeder's strengths. I think he's actually going to get more opportunities to really showcase what he can do playing off the bench as opposed to sharing a lot of touches with LeBron and AD, maybe Kuzma. But to Brez's point, I wouldn't be shocked by the idea of, okay, let's give this thing a start so we can at least say we gave it a run. You know, we, we gave you this opportunity. This is what's best for the team. All right, AK, question number three. We go back to you first. The preseason phenom, the MVP, THT. He does play in the season opener on Tuesday. You counting that or you doubt that? Oh, count that. The, the guy's <laughs> a folk hero. I mean, he's already got a statue in the works right now. You can't not play this guy. Oh. I'm not saying he's going to start. I'm not saying he's going to lead all scorers. But come on, you have to play THT. Uh, no. It would be criminal at this point not to. It would, it would be right malfeasance. It would be malfeasance <laughs> by Frank Bogle not to do this. Amazing bad cop wow. came out during wow. counter. Jesus. Doubt it. You know the control room is going to love that when they're voting. <laughs> THT yeah. plays in the season opener on Tuesday, Press. Yeah, I'm going to count this. Uh, I'm not sure he's going to be like in the first half, but maybe yeah. if the Lakers get ahead in that second half, they say, you know what, THT, we're going to reward you for an amazing uh, preseason. Got to make it happen. Got to see what this kid can do when the real games matter. He's going to get some playing time. I don't think it'll be more than like 12 or 13 minutes. Though. Wish you guys could hear my uh, producer, Ryan Trainer <laughs> and his dialogue about you two right now and who's in the lead and you guys are agreeing with everything. It's pretty good. Uh, Brez, I'm going to go with you right now. Clippers spoil ring night and beat the Lakers. You going to count that or doubt that? No, I'm going to doubt that. I mean, I know you watched the uh, first two preseason games like, like we all did. And uh, the Lakers... Preseason press. Not only did the Lakers win that, but LeBron and AD did not even play in those games. And I know, you know, the big Pre guys from the Clippers, they only played about 15, 20 minutes in those games. Lakers are ready to go. And I think uh, I think Trez is really going to be the, the, the X factor in this, the deciding point. Ooh. He's going to put the Lakers over the top. Clippers spoil ring night. Beat the Lakers, Andy. 
I'm doubting that one as well. And it's not about me being a Laker homer or anything like that. The Clippers have not looked good in the no, preseason. No. Like by by their own admission, they haven't been particularly sharp. They have not had the type of urgency that you would expect, even in preseason. Just knowing everything that happened in the bubble with this team, I I've been surprised, frankly, by, by the way they've come out. So I don't picture them beating the Lakers in this game, especially because the Lakers, I think, are going to be up for it. It's for some guy, a lot of guys on this team, their first championship. They're going to be excited to get those rings. So, no, I doubt it. Lakers are going to win this one. All right, there's lots of discussion going on in the uh, control room. There's going to be a recount, apparently, and we will have the results Wait, on oh, the other wow. side. A cliffhanger. It's called a tease, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> results tease. on the other side.